Today on Seculo, Iran's despicable attack on U.S. children. Keeping you informed and engaged, now more than ever. This is Seculo. We want to hear from you. Share and post your comments or call 1-800-684-3110. And now your host, Jordan Seculo. So I want you to understand the severity of what Iran attempted to do. The U.S. was able to thwart this, but this is what they're trying to do, I'm sure, all over the United States, to the point where the FBI director, Christopher Wray, has come out to let everyone know, probably to also be on guard if you are a children's hospital. Yes, Iran used uh, Iranian-sponsored hackers to attempt a cyber attack against Boston Children's Hospital last summer. At the same time, the Biden administration was starting to renew uh, trying to renew their talks to get into the nuclear deal again with Iran. But Christopher Ray, I just want to set it up this way. This is what they were trying to do here was to cause death and destruction and chaos. He called it, quote, one of the most despicable cyber attacks I've seen. So to me, this separates it from the cyber attacks like on uh, banking or yeah, economic exactly. attacks, which which are catastrophic in their own way. But when you literally, whatever they were trying to do, it was trying to hurt kids. That's what Iran is trying to do. And I want to remind people, they have said they want to take, you know, vengeance against the United States to avenge the, the killing of Soleimani, the former head of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. So thankfully, this time it was caught and the FBI was able to get involved. And I'm sure it's a warning to all children's hospitals and all hospitals that Iran is trying to attempt not some economic uh, sabotage. No but some actual chaos which would lead to death this of is children. A, this is not how would it affect your ATM, no. which is you know typically, or how would it affect the uh, utilities. Or the Internet. Yeah, or, or bringing down the Internet for a period of time. This was this is what the FBI director said. This was an sponsored by the, uh, the attack, sponsored by the Iranian government, aimed at Boston Children's Hospital. Now think about what the computer systems do at Boston Children's Hospital. Not just records, but... Robotic surgeries. I mean, just you could go through the list of horrors. That's why he said it's one of, he doesn't explain the exact reason, but one of the most despicable cyber attacks I've seen. But it was also interesting, in talking about this, he said the, we have ongoing threats from Russia, North Korea, Iran, and he included this time China. Uh, we've got Mike Pompeo joining us later in the broadcast to talk more about that. But I thought that was interesting, too. The way he's categorized as he added that the Chinese government is prolific and effective at cyber espionage threatening the United States. Yeah, I think what's key there, we were, we were having our morning meeting, is that China is included in that category now, um, at least by Christopher Ray when he's talking. So he's not afraid to say Russia is the same as China, is the same as Iran, is the same as North Korea. He's putting them in that group. And what's interesting is that Russia Iran and, and China, we don't, I mean, Russia, Iran, and uh, North Korea, we don't have serious economic relationships with at all. In fact, we have sanctions against economic relationships with. But China, while they're trying to conduct the attacks similar to what he's saying Iran, North Korea, and Russia are doing, we have so many economic uh, attachments to that it's impossible right now to just say, oh, we don't want to do business with China anymore. No, we can't. We we, we're not ready we, to do it. We we're, could, we're not we could put ourselves on a path. But, you know, that's like putting yourself on energy independence. You have to put yourself back on manufacturing path and at least or find other countries to work with as well. Or both. Uh, and do both. This administration is doing neither. But what we are finding out is but that they're sitting down with the Iranians or attempting to to negotiate a nuclear deal. And there's no indication that President Biden is even having second thoughts about that. No. I mean, I think that the only thing stalling that out has nothing to do with the Biden administration directly. Russia. It's because of the invasion of Ukraine and Russia was the go between between the United States and Iran. I don't think Russia is in any rush to help the United States right now on a deal or help the Biden administration get some deal. And uh, and because of that, it's it's been stalled. But that doesn't mean they wouldn't take it tomorrow. Right. They would jump back into that deal tomorrow if they with could. the same bullet points, two pages, unsigned deal. Right. No no question about it. Folks, we've got a very interesting broadcast coming up. Marco Rubio, Senator Rubio, is going to be joining us later in the broadcast, as is former Secretary of State mike pompeo so we're going to get into this issue we've got other issues we're going to hit as well we'll take your calls at 800-684-3110 don't forget support the work of the aclj at aclj.org
The FBI director calls it one of the most despicable cyber attack plots he has ever seen. His agents stopped it from happening, sparing Boston Children's Hospital. FBI Director Christopher Wray says the hackers were with the Iranian government and that agents prevented the attack last summer. We got a report from one of our intelligence partners indicating Boston Children's was about to be targeted. FBI Director Christopher Wray says the tip came last summer and the FBI and Boston Children's cyber team immediately sprung into action. The two already had a long-standing relationship which was key to blocking the threat before it could disable the hospital systems. Quick actions by everyone involved especially at the hospital, protected both the network and the sick kids who depended on it. The Cybersecurity expert Peter Tran says he's not surprised, unfortunately, because healthcare systems are so interconnected. And as a result, he says they're an ideal target for criminal hackers. Having access to Boston Children's gives them um, more access, like a hub and spoke, type of entry. So you can conceivably see how Mass General might be also a target, the Brigham and Women's, um, Beth Israel, any of the large research teaching hospitals that have a presence there. Now, Tran says the hackers may not necessarily want patient information, but the biopharmaceutical research and data that the hospitals collect. Malicious cyber activity cost U.S. companies $7 billion, $184 million in losses here in New England. But at a hospital, a cyber attack can cost lives. Boston Children's releasing a statement saying, thanks to the FBI and our staff working so closely together, we proactively thwarted the threat to our network. The FBI also told us today that since Russia invaded Ukraine, they are manning a 24-7 command center to monitor cyber threats here in the U.S. All right, welcome back to Secchio. So again, called one of the most despicable cyber attacks I've seen, an attempted cyber attack thwarted by the FBI on Boston Children's Hospital. And there's multiple reasons why Iran would want to do this. One is you could wreak havoc and, and cause the loss of life of children, sick children, who are in the hospital. But second, also, this, this Boston is a hub for, for medical research hospitals. And if you get into one, you can kind of get into all of them and start stealing all sorts of data, bio data, personal data. Um, so the chaos that can come with it, it was thwarted. But I want to play this from Christopher Ray, the FBI director, Fight 17. Hackers sponsored by the Iranian government tried to conduct one of the most despicable cyber attacks I've ever seen right here in Boston when they decided to go after Boston Children's Hospital. You, you realize what, they, what they're doing here. They, we, when we, and we said this in the last thing, but when we talk about cyber attacks, we're normally talking about financial institutions, Bribes. utilities. Things like that. You got to pay a criminal. Yeah, uh, there's a bribe involved. Money and we'll Here, Andy, they, they, the Iranians upped it by going after a hospital that serves serves sick children. This is the, this is why the, uh, Director Ray calls it despicable. There are other words to describe it, but despicable is is just an understatement of what it is. You have sick children, dying children in cancer units and other kinds of units, all dependent upon machines. Computers. I'm not computer savvy to but, give the right word. Knives when they but do the surgeries all these now. things. I mean, Robotics. even 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 doing cataract surgery on little children requires the use of the internet and requires the use of these facilities. And they're going after those to disable those, to steal from those, to kill those patients. At the same time, what the irony of this, Colonel Smith, is that you have the United States almost begging to still get back in to this deal with Iran. And you said before we went on air that in these talks, you cannot mention terror. Mm -hmm. You cannot mention a cyber attack. Right. That it's only related to this nuclear situation. The nuclear the, program. The, yeah. Uh, under the original uh, agreements of the JCPOA, as that was hammered out by the Obama administration, the two things that, that they agreed they would not address was Iran's ballistic missile program and their terror activities. Believe it or not, we're negotiating with the world's leading state sponsor of terrorism, but in our negotiations, we can't bring that up. That was in the original JCPOA. So when the new talks uh, began in Vienna last year under the Biden administration, 
those same agreements apply. They are talking about nuclear enrichment only. They cannot bring up terror, and this this attack on Boston's children was a terror attack, and they cannot bring up Iran's ballistic missile there's program. There's already reports that the uranium enrichment capabilities of Iran are already reaching the point where it's quite feasible that they could have a nuclear weapon in short order. And and the, and the JCPOA only went for, what, total of 10 years, mm-hmm. and we're, six of those are gone. Yes. Well, one of the things we pointed out on our website just this week is that right now we've discovered that Iran, not, we've, we've known for a while, but the head of the IAEA confirmed it uh, last week, and that is they now have uranium at 60% level. 90% is weapons grade. They're only supposed to have it at 3.76%. But here's the deal, Jay. Because they have this, we discovered this week, they actually possess 95 pounds of 60% enriched uranium. 90% is weapons grade. However, in addition to that 95 pounds, which is enough for one nuclear bomb, according to the IAEA this week, but in addition to that, they have these advanced centrifuges, which they're not supposed to have, and the IAEA has, has confirmed they have them, and they say that they can take that 60% uranium and in two weeks enrich it to 90%, and with that 95 pounds, that gives them enough for one bomb. We are on the cusp of Iran becoming a nuclear power. Mm. And at the same time, I mean, I would say this. This is you know, what Christopher Ray announced. This is what we want the FBI to be doing. You know, this is the, right. the, the work of the FBI, the not politics, foreign actors, stopping cyber attacks on children's hospitals. And yet at the same time, remember, politically, it doesn't make a ton of sense because you still have an administration that would love to get back to a deal with Iran. It's like we, we talked about earlier in the week. It's what is enough for the people to say enough already. We're not going to try to get back into this deal. I mean, so listen to Ted Cruz talk to Tony Blinken. This is about Iran uh, uh, pledging to stop trying to kill U.S. government officials. Take a listen. Is it true that American negotiators made specific requests for a commitment that the IRGC will stop trying to murder former American officials? And is it true that they said no? Uh, Senator, I'm not going to get into the details of any discussions or negotiations in a uh, public forum. Happy to come back and talk. Uh, privately uh, about that. Uh, let me, but let me address a few things that, uh, that you've raised because I do think uh, that they're important. First of all, uh, I share uh, your views on uh, the IRGC and especially uh, a number of its component parts, notably the Quds Force, which is primarily responsible for the uh, egregious actions that it has taken in terms of targeting Americans and, as you rightly say, uh, continuing uh, to do so. Can we get another... Uh, affirmation from our government that Iran is still trying to kill U.S. officials and Americans, and we now president. know about the cyber attack on the hospital, on our children's so, hospital. So, here, two questions I have, Andy, is and these following what Jordan just said. Yep. Number one, we've got basically an admission by the Secretary of State. It's no shock that, of course, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard are taking actions or trying to take actions to harm American officials. And we know that the FBI thwarted the attack on Boston Children's Hospital. You work closely with the FBI. We have worked at the, with the State Department on various matters. The concern here has to be, and you know the FBI, and Jordan's right, this is what the FBI is supposed to do. Right. This is what they're trained to do. What We're seeing just a little bit of it. There's got to be a lot more. Oh, 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 enormously amount uh, more that that is here that we don't know. But what is bothering me is when I hear Secretary Blinken basically saying to Senator Cruz, "Don't I don't want to get into anything that may disturb or distress the Iranians. This is not anything that we want to do that was going to disturb. I share your views, but I'm not going to. And there's component parts. A lot of this double talk, and I'll come back and talk privately about it. But publicly, I don't want to do anything that's going to disturb or distress the Iranians because we, the Biden administration, is determined to get this this JCPOA-type deal through at all costs, no matter whether they attack Boston Children's Hospital, Grady Hospital in Atlanta, the Massachusetts General Hospital, or whoever it is that they attack, don't distress and don't disturb those poor Iranians, even though they're trying to kill us. You've got an interesting comment that came in on Facebook from Jones. says, why does uh, President Biden want to deal with a nation that wants to destroy both the United States and Israel? Uh, I, that's a good question because it, it borders on the insane. I think right. part of it is it's a political victory for them because the JCPOA started out in the Obama-Biden administration. 
Part of it is naivete. I'll give you an example of the naivete, Jay. Last week, uh, Robert Malley, who is our chief negotiator for the Iran nuclear deal now, testified before Congress. And they brought up things like the terror attacks. And, of course, this attack on Boston's children happened last summer. Right. When they brought it up to him, he said, yes, but still, the benefits of this agreement outweigh the risk of negotiating with the state sponsor of terror. Our lead negotiator actually said that before Congress last week. It, Jordan, the problem here is, and we've dealt with the Iranian regime, uh, with the state through the State Department, obviously, in cases that we've had of persecuted imprisoned pastors. We know what this regime is capable of. The idea that we are still begging for a resolution here is breathtaking. Yeah, especially because of what they, domestic, their domestic political situation changed, even from the Obama administration to today. They went from trying to put in what they call a moderate regime, a more moderate regime, to now a much more radical regime. So we're much more like, remember the days we, we uncovered that the Obama team was even trying to work with Ahmadinejad and those guys? Right. It's back to those type of guys, yeah. right? You see, in, in the leader of Iran, these are hardliners again. So they're not even trying to use the the fronts that they used to use as these kind of more softer right. touch leaders with the kind of the the extreme leaders behind them. But now they've got the extremists back in. So there's so many reasons. Whether yeah. it's the cyber attacks, the their nuclear program, their their actual killing of U.S. troops in Syria, but using uh, their proxies like the Quds Force in Hezbollah. It's interesting, Andy. They, they, I go back to you on this because talk about the FBI. Christopher Ray also said when it comes to potential Russian hacking threats to the U.S., the FBI has been on what he calls, quote, combat tempo with the 24-7 command center during the Kremlin's war in Ukraine. This is according to Christopher Ray. What does that mean? Combat tempo means that, that it's prelude to war. We are looking at this as a prelude to the possibility of having war. So we are on that kind of an, a high alert. Why that same sort of alert is not applied to the Iranians, I don't understand. Why we coddle the Iranians and make sure that they're not unhappy, and we won't answer in before the United States Senate as to what we are doing, as Senator Cruz said, to stop the murder of former American officials is beyond me. I don't understand it. Yeah. All right, folks, we'll take your calls to this, too, 1-800-684-3110. That's 1-800-684-3110. And a very cool show coming up to get into all this more. We're also getting into school uh, security with Senator Marco Rubio. Another issue uh, domestically here that is very important, I know to me, uh, with three kids uh, in school, my third on the way to uh, starting school next year. So, I mean, uh, you know, it's something on everybody's mind, and he's trying to do something about it. So Senator Marco Rubio, Florida is going to be on when people say there's no solutions that no one has anything to plan well he's actually got two pieces of legislation also mike pompeo will join us we get to more of the international issues and the cyber attack and also what's going on with china with him so you definitely want to check out the broadcast today go to aclj.org i'm before you today and it's a humbling experience for me but the task that we have before us is great and we have no time for delay in one of my very first supreme court arguments one of the legal journals said i was rude aggressive, and obnoxious. We won that case unanimously. In 2009, we opened our permanent office in Jerusalem. One year later, I found myself before the International Criminal Court in The Hague, the ICC. The Palestinian Authority, much like the BDS movement of today, sought to utilize an international tribunal for one purpose and one purpose only to delegitimize the Jewish state of Israel. I argued the law, and the law was clear. The Palestinian Authority was not a state. It had no business being before the ICC, and the case must be dismissed. BDS is the flip side of that same coin. We call it lawfare, utilizing the legal system to delegitimize a people or a group. They cloak it in the garb of the civil rights movement. This is no civil rights movement. This is an unconstitutional and illegal advocacy taking place in the United States of America. Make no mistake, the goal is unambiguous. The intent is clear. It is to create an environment so hostile that those students of you that are here today would be afraid to say the word, I am a Zionist, I am a Jew. Never 
Never, on the memory of our families, should we allow that to take place, and the least in the United States of America. All right, welcome back to Secu. We are taking your phone calls to 1-800-684-3110. A couple of ACLJ issues for you as well that we're working on. One of those issues, uh, and if you're listening to the broadcast, if you're watching the broadcast, you know one of those issues we, we focus on a lot is, of course, support for Israel. We have an office in Jerusalem. We had Jeff Balaban from our office in Jerusalem on earlier in the week. Uh, but we also, of course, have to work on those issues all over the world because there's an international effort to delegitimize the Jewish state of Israel. That's the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. We've seen it popular on college campuses, also in some liberal cities. So states have taken action across the country. Uh, states like Texas and Arkansas have taken action to say, we're not going to do contracts with companies who support the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. No state contracts, no city contracts as well. And we filed in both of those states uh, because there are either cities that want to do business or companies yeah. that, that want to do business uh, with the state who have these policies. And this, again, is a policy to delegitimize the Jewish state. A, 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 a country. Just take out the Jewish state first. It's delegitimizing a nation. We talk a lot about Ukraine and the borders and, and having sovereignty over your borders. That's what this movement's about. It's about uh, removing your sovereignty, removing your independence, and, and, and attacking your right to exist. We have a series of cases that we've got a, we've got a direct case, uh, two of them, involving uh, BDS matters where Palestinian groups have sued our clients, including well-named clients, sometimes uh, uh, what they call settlements, but these are portions of Israel and Judea and Samaria. Jeff Balaban talked about that early in the week. And we're defending them in federal court in the District of Columbia and the D.C. Court of Appeals. Then you have the flip side of the BDS movement, which is they go after, they, they try to get companies not to do business uh, with Israel because of the policies they disagree with. And this BDS movement has been around for, for 10 years. But it has, CC, it has, we have dealt with it at the UN. We've dealt with it at the college campus. We have dealt with it in federal court, but it is unrelenting. It keeps popping up. Every and time. Absolutely. It's not just um, in businesses. We see it, like you said, on college campuses. So they're targeting young kids to make sure that they're basically poisoned with this ideology that Israel is bad. You know, you take it a step further, too, Andy, and that is. Here we've got two cases in federal court. We filed briefs at the, both the Eighth Circuit and the Fifth Circuit, where the states have said, look, we're not going to support BDS comp companies that are engaged in boycott. First of all, what BDS is, boycott, boycott the state of Israel, divest, don't invest in there, and sanction, penalize Israel. So states around the country are starting to say, we're not going to tolerate that anymore. And then these businesses are saying, well, we support that, so you're not going to do business with us. We file a, They file a lawsuit. State that's, has the right to take a position. Of course it does, and that's what we're advocating and what we're saying. Look, the objectives, activities, and effects of BDS is to is definitely anti-Semitic. I don't see this against Greece. I don't see this against Italy. I don't see this against France. Why are they targeting the state of Israel? Because they are seeking to undermine its very existence. So the Texas law, which passed unanimously in the House with overwhelming support in the Texas Senate, prohibits states from contracting with companies, what, who discriminatorily boycott Israel. Texas does a lot of business with Israel. And simply put, it makes bad business sense right. for the con state to contract with suppliers and others who actively engage in economic boycotts with one of Texas's largest business partners. And that's what we are supporting. So I'm holding in my hands. We can put them on the screen as well for those watching on our social media platforms. Two briefs uh, in the Court of Appeals, one in the Fifth, one in the Eighth Circuit. Now, in addition to this, we've got a, an active case in the District of Columbia, the D.C. Circuit, where we're dealing with this issue. And understand that they don't stop. And it's the same group of lawyers that we dealt with at the International Criminal Court in The Hague are the same lawyers that back these moves here in the United States. So the entire attempt of this uh, is to delegitimize Israel. We've got professors that we have to defend and we're willing to defend, honored to defend because they've made pro-Israel statements, talk about Israel being the only real democracy uh, in the region that protects religious freedom, for instance, it's getting better with some of the uh, Abraham Accords and some of the partners in the region now. 
And then you have a situation where we have students that are harassed because they are pro-Israel or Jewish or both on campuses like Harvard and others that have significant Jewish populations. And then you have the litigation strategy that they're engaging in. So all of this is taking place simultaneously. Yeah, I, I think what we have to you know underscore here is the work of the ACLJ. Uh, so not we're in Israel uh, and the work on the national security issues for uh, Israel there. But we, we've been at the ICC for Israel, the International Criminal Court, defending them from you know attempts to criminally prosecute Israeli, and they're always trying to go back to that. They're trying again now uh, because of uh, someone from Al Jazeera who was caught in a crossfire. It looks like. Uh, in a protest, or may have even, you know, been uh, again in a, a, a ju- war journalist. Unfortunately, it's a dangerous. Uh, it, it is dangerous. It doesn't mean you get to um, file uh, lawsuits or bring international criminal court cases because um, you decided to be a war journalist and put yourself in those situations that you know are dangerous. I mean, that's unfortunate. Um, again, for any journalist, I don't care what what network they come from, but it doesn't mean that the yeah. Israelis are directly responsible. Then we see the BDS movement. So it is. There are when you say like we're going to fight for Israel. When a group says that, if you hear somebody say that, to really understand what that fight is, you've got to understand the multi pronged. Uh, so you've got to say there's a fight in the U.S. on BDS, and that's also in Europe, especially. Right. We've got, then you've got the European ICC. Then you've got the actual national security interests of Israel because of Iran and bad actors. There's also positives like the Abraham Accords, bringing more peace to the region with with Sunni countries. So I think all of that. Very important. And the ACL, so we're involved in court, in policy, and in governmental levels. Also, we have filed a submission, CC, with the UN Human Rights Council, urging protection of our our case involving a Christian woman in Pakistan. What's yeah, the latest so, on that? So the Human Rights Council is in its 50th session right now, and one of their agenda items was protecting uh, women. And so Pakistan typically has at least a 1,000 young Christian and Hindu girls and women that are forced uh, to marry Muslim men each year. And so we address that issue. We we specifically bring up our case that our um, affiliate with the ECLJ, we have a, an affiliate in law office in Pakistan. Uh, we have a client there, uh, the parents of a 14-year-old girl mm. who literally um, the day before she disappeared, she's uh, been kidnapped, just disappeared, but the day before she had, I think it was over 40 contacts, inappropriate contacts on her cell phone. They don't even know how this 45-year-old Muslim neighbor got her cell phone. Contacted her out of the blue 45 times. The next day she's gone. They go to the police. They can't get the police to investigate. Uh, we've taken this case. We've gone all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court literally told the parents that if you can tell us where your daughter is, we will have the police. We will force the police to go get her. Now, you've also are thinking or contemplating and maybe have already action at the U.N. on in addition to the Human Rights Council, um, to the, the arbitrary detention, those kind of things. Those are options we're looking yeah, at. Yes. So we always look at the options that we can have on the international stage and particularly at the U.N. And we bring this case up every chance we can. Uh, before the UN. So, you know, we're hopeful that we can find this child, but it's, uh, you know, two years and she is gone. We are we are fighting folks on so many levels. Uh, you see it, whether it's dealing with Iran and trying to impact policy, whether it's in the courts with BDS, whether it's in the halls of Congress. We'll be joined coming up by Senator Marco Rubio and former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. None of this happens without your support of the American Center for Law and Justice. We encourage you to do that at aclj.org at aclj.org we're going to be back with more in just a moment and all these issues that we talk about you can learn a lot more so if you want to spend time in, uh, with writing or share it with your friends and family it's all there at aclj.org we'll be right back Senator Rubio Mike Pompeo we're in a fight for life that is incredible right now barbaric and horrific this is the New York State's law on unrestricted abortion no protection for the unborn child not only they pass it they celebrated it zero protection used to have personhood protection right. now they don't that is now all completely repealed we've handled a series of cases involving those that are being persecuted for the faith they call the terrorism but they actually use in the indictment itself the word Christianization. A principal comes and yanks your Bible away. A teacher became aware that the student was reading from the Bible. We're here standing for these kids and their families, prohibited from meeting with other Christians during recess. We do have to fight against them when they occur, otherwise those abuses will win the day. This is a fight that you're going to have to be engaged in. It's already a long-term struggle. It is not over. 
We are so grateful to the people who prayed for us, and we are so grateful for ACLJ. Keeping you informed and engaged, now more than ever, this is Seculo. And now your host, Jordan Seculo. Hey, welcome back to Seculo. And folks, a great half hour coming up live, Mike, uh, Mike Pompeo. But next, in the next segment, after this short segment, Marco Rubio, Senator Marco Rubio, and talking about a topic that, uh, again, if you're a grandparent or parent, uh, it's still on the front of your mind, and this is uh, the school shootings and what we can do. Are there common sense pieces of legislation uh, that can be done at the federal level? Uh, and, and maybe they've been also done at the state level before. And people say, well, there's no one has any solutions. No one has any ideas. Senator Rubio has two pieces, uh, two two pieces of legislation that should not have opposition from the, the Democrats. I think he'll probably really has to explain it more to conservatives and make sure that the, some of the Second Amendment groups don't just outright oppose it. But I, we're going to have him on to talk about it because I think that it's on the front. I, you know, I know that I'm talking to folks who are supporters of the Second Amendment. We filed in every one of those cases, so uh, ACLJ. So it's not about that issue. It's about what do you do uh, to secure our schools so that your thought of the day is not maybe, you know, I, I hope to pick up my child that day or I hope they get dropped off at home from school safely. And then you've got to worry about all the other things you've got to protect from. But this – should still be a safe, it should be a safe Absolutely. place, whether it's a public or a private school. We're also going to be joined by Mike Pompeo, uh, former Secretary of State, our Senior Counsel for Global Affairs, about some of the comments coming out of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights on China and how he is basically repeating the Chinese Communist Party's talking points, which puts some. But I want to go back to the Iran situation that we talked about earlier. The idea that we've had an attack attempt that's now public on Boston Children's Hospital by the Iranian regime, while the Biden administration is begging for a nuclear deal with the Iranians, to me is, Andy, frankly, disgusting. It is disgusting. It is despicable, and it's unbelievable that a United States administration is negotiating with the great, with the biggest sponsor of terrorism in the world, and that is the Iranians. But during those negotiations in Vienna, we are not allowed to talk about terrorism or cyber threats, or anything that may upset or discombobulate the the, uh, the Iranians in some fashion to upset them or worry them because we're so anxious to give away everything that we have gained through prior administrations in terms of a stopgap on the production of a, Ura a nuclear bomb by the you Iranians. Know, we can do everything, but we can't upset them. Th this is a They are trying to reset the Biden... Uh, years when he was the vice president with uh, President Obama. That's what this is. This whole going back to Iran is a, a reset of their, quote, their glory days, as, as they view it, even though the Iranians violated the agreement the entire time and and have now uranium enriched at, what was it, not what Wes Smith said, 90, at, at 90, which is enough to make a, or close to making a nuclear weapon. Yeah, I mean, this, this is the deal. There's no reason to be doing a deal with Iran. We should be looking at how to sanction Iran more, how to make it more difficult for Iran. We should be carrying out cyber attacks on Iran's nuclear weapon system. We should be working with allies to convince them that Iran is no good. And and, and we have a good potential allegiance in the region of not just Israel versus Iran, but Israel plus the Gulf states. Yes. And so you've got very wealthy countries. They're much they're smaller than Iran, but combined they have a much better economies and, and good militaries because their militaries work with the U.S. very closely. So it's no longer this just Israel, Israel versus. the U.S. versus Iran. And these are countries that are going to say, you know, if, if Iran goes nuclear, and it, you know, Israel doesn't really deny, but everybody believes Israel's got nuclear weapons. Okay, so what about us? You know, we've got the money to do it, so do we need to purchase it from you to protect our own citizens? And that would go to all of those Gulf states who have made, you know, we're encouraged by the U.S. to, to go into those deals with, with, uh, with Israel. You know, right now you can, you can travel to Saudi Arabia on Israeli passport. Yep. Saudi Arabia is not part of the Abraham Accords, but they are, that's the how open things are becoming. And and we should utilize Iran, isolate them, but bring together a region of the world that is usually so volatile. And they always are trying to distract you with the Palestinian right. issue. But use it as a, a time to actually build up a whole new alliance against exactly. Iran. And we at the American Center for Law and Justice, we have an office staffed in 
Jerusalem. The American Center for Law, and it's an ACLJ office. ACLJ, Jerusalem, Israel. Your support of the ACLJ makes all that happen. ACLJ.org. Back to Senator Rubio. And now to Washington, where lawmakers remain in a bitter partisan gridlock over what can be done to prevent the next school shooting. And at the local level, officials are debating once again the use of school resource officers. The question on top of many parents' minds, are my children safe at school? There have been 27 school shootings this year alone, according to Education Week. The disturbing rise in violence leading a growing number of schools to incorporate extensive safety measures all in an effort to avoid being the site of the next school shooting. The superintendent of Millville, New Jersey, has been installing cameras, panic alarms, and locks. We had to put time and energy into the human behavior of making sure the school uh, is secure for our kids and for our staff. CBS News has learned U.S. schools have spent 150 million federal dollars since 2018 for so-called school hardening, including in Logan County, West Virginia. We have over 100 cameras either inside or outside of Chapmanville Regional High School. But even senators who've helped pursue this grant money question if it's a solution. So we're going to build bunkers and castles for our children. And, and does that solve this problem? We have a school safety problem, so let's address what we can. Clearly, there was more security needed at this school. You, you can't argue that. School districts from Texas to Missouri to Arizona to Virginia tell CBS News they're reviewing policies or staffing or ordering new training to keep students safe. Back in 2019, we profiled a school in upstate New York employing this first-of-its-kind system. The technology immediately recognizes a gun pulled from its holster. If Officer Stover were a school shooter, this new high-tech security system would immediately call the police and then track his every movement by scanning both his face and the gun. We really have to make every attempt to stay on the most cutting edge, if you will, of that technology. Welcome back to Seculo. It's great to be joined by Senator Marco Rubio of Florida. And he's got two pieces of legislation addressing something near and dear to me because I have two kids already in school and one on the way next fall. And when you see these uh, school shootings, which is it's a plague in our country, we, we see it too often, way too often, to similar people, similar problems with security. And then people say, well, there's no solutions. But there are senators with solutions, yep. putting forward solutions, and sometimes there's not getting enough attention. We wanted to make sure Senator Rubio could get attention on two solutions he's got in the U.S. Senate. So, Senator Rubio, thanks for being with us. This is Jay Sekiel. I'm glad you're on. You've got two bills that you've been working on for years uh, to prevent, to help prevent the, these mass shootings in schools. Will you explain this? Because I think we have to. Ha you've got reasonable solutions here that need to move forward. Yeah, so part of what bothers me every time this happens is that they come out with a bunch of solutions that people are in favor of because they want to restrict guns or whatever their personal views on it might be, but it has nothing to do with the actual shooting, like they wouldn't have prevented what actually happened. My point is we can continue to debate that other stuff, but if the goal is to stop these shootings, then we need to be focused on passing things that will stop, has a chance to stop these shootings. So two things. The first is we now have sufficient and have had for a long time research that tells us, by and large, who are the people that do this? There's a lot of commonality. And generally, you're talking about a young man who suffers some early childhood trauma of some sort, child abuse, sexual abuse, broken home, whatever it may be, who starts to feel, get disconnected, uh, starts having self-hate, transforms that self-hate into hatred of others, starts blaming others, starts to get fascinated with guns, making threats for a extended period of time, in some cases even acting out. And then one day walks into a gun store, registered legal gun store, passes a background check, never committed a crime before, and buys a gun and commits a mass murder. So the first piece of legislation is to use the Secret Service's well-established National Threat Assessment Center to identify people who are headed in this direction weeks, months, potentially years before they become a killer. And, and the second piece of legislation is an intervention that allows states like Florida has done with due process to be able to go to court and show the evidence to a judge and say, look, this person's headed in a really bad direction, we're worried about it, and, and put a red flag on their record so that they can't go in and buy a gun. Um, you know, obviously the person's going to get due process and make an argument against it. And in Florida, we have penalties for false claims and things of this nature. And I think it's best done at the state level. You don't want a federal law that does it because most 
cities in America, many cities in America don't have a federal courthouse, and federal agencies aren't going to do this. I mean, it's going to be your local sheriff's department or police officers are going to do it. But the notion of identifying this profile and intervening before they actually uh, kill people is the best way, the most effective way, and I believe primarily the only way that we're going to keep this from continuing to happen. So, Ruby, I wanted to go to this, the second uh, bill first because I, I think people probably want to know more about it. So if, because it involves a legal process. And I, I ta- read when I read about this piece of legislation and, and your work on it and, and how it's been used in Florida specifically, because people use Florida as kind of an example of a conservative state they like to follow. And this is a, a law similar in Florida. And it's been used, you said, over 3,000 times. And and likely those 3,000 times that prevents another uh, Parkland. It prevents another shooting like in Texas. It prevents another one of these uh, horrendous events. And it's, it adds another tool for law enforcement, but it still allows for due process. So key items for people who are listening right now. Yeah, and it's not permanent. So you're going to have to keep going back to court every six months and, and to, to prove your case if you think this is an ongoing threat from this individual. And uh, generally, the way it's used as a family member, it becomes very concerned about somebody. And in many cases, it's not because they're going to kill somebody else. It's going to kill themselves. And so they're like, look, I'm really worried about this person. This person has a bunch of guns, has become fascinated with guns, are talking about hurting themselves, hurting other people. And this is a restraining order is what it basically is. Like we have existing restraining orders for domestic violence and things of that nature. But it also and, and it, it also can only be filed by law enforcement. That is, you have to convince a police department to do it, right? They have to go to court and do it. You can't do it yourself. You can't just go into a courtroom and say, hey, my, you know, my ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend is dangerous. Will you take away their guns? So there's that extra step of protection. And obviously, look, they have to go in and, and make the case. There's got to be evidence provided at convincing a judge of a court order, just like we do when the police want to go into your home and search it. they got to have a court order. So it uses the same process. It, we don't have, at least as of now, seen evidence of it being misused. There's a push to have a federal version of that. I don't think a federal version of it is a good idea. I don't think the FBI and these agencies are going to be focused on this stuff. I just don't think they have the manpower or the focus on it. I think it's best left at the state level. And states don't need us to pass a bill to do it. We're just trying to incentivize them to do it. Senator, let me ask you this. Amongst your colleagues, uh, because I'm with you, I think we've got to have common sense measures here. You can protect the Second Amendment and also can protect children's lives. Um, what's your sense among your colleagues, both Republican and Democrats, on this legislation? Look, I think they haven't received – these bills have been out there for four years now, okay? And they haven't gotten voted on for, for, two, for one primary reason. Let's not forget now, Joe Biden's been in the White House for over a year. Democrats have had Congress for over a year. They haven't moved on any of these things uh, yet. And the reason why is because they're, they, they're based, people that are out there demanding, want things like preventing guns based on what they look like, not what they do. Not how dangerous they are, but what they look like. Or expanded background checks. We already have expanded that. Virtually every gun that's going to be sold in America today is going to have a background check conducted. Every one of these mass shooters passed the background check. So there's still a perception out there among people that you can just walk in and buy a gun in a store and nobody checks you out. That's just not accurate. Almost every gun sold in America today and every day is virtually all of them have undergone background checks, and all of these shooters have. So the, the question really is, but that's what they're fixated on. So they want to, you, you see the House proposals, right? Oh, let's ban bump stocks and stuff like this. That, that all may be great and good ideas, but it has nothing to do with this, with the shootings. Wouldn't have prevented these shootings. So I think that's what's been standing in the way, maximalist demands that have nothing to do with how to solve the problem. And hopefully that'll change. Hopefully this time people will say, look, enough is enough. There's some things we can do that we agree on. Let's do the things we agree on. Let's do the, if, if there's something that works, and we agree on it, why not do it? Well, what's good about and, uh, both, both of these bills, Senator, is that it tailors to the situation. It actually, It's not just a, a, a Band-Aid, so to speak. It actually impacts the actual situation that unfortunately is occurring in the United States too common, too frequently. Yeah, well, we have another gun crisis in America, and that is a bunch of criminals running loose in the streets, buying guns off the black market, stealing them from people's cars, and shooting each other up. And, uh, and we've seen that violence surge. But these aren't people buying it at gun shows or online or anywhere. These are just people buying stolen guns from each other and then shooting each other up. That, that's a, a huge problem in America, but that's a criminality problem. That's what happens when you let a bunch of criminals out of jail early because you're trying to be compassionate and trying to get people the fifth chance and things of that nature. So that's, a, that's another problem. It's probably, the, from a numerical standpoint, the most serious one. The, one, the solutions I'm talking about are very specifically tied to disturbed young men that – that, that head towards violence and commit these mass murders, and they're giving you warning signs well, and in Parkland, well in advance. 
that this was going to happen. And in fact, there were efforts to get the local police to intervene. The sheriff's office didn't do it. That guy's no longer sheriff. The school district refused to do anything about it because they didn't want to criminalize kids. The FBI dropped the ball with two calls and warnings to their hotline. So there were a lot of missteps there that could have prevented this. Now, we, we just got a, an alert that, that President Biden is going to be addressing the nation tonight after this last shooting at the hospital and this wave of mass shootings. So, uh, Senator Rubin, this is what I'm concerned about, is that typically what we've seen with, with President Biden in these comments is that statements that he keeps dividing all of us as a nation. And and so it's 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 divide, divide, divide. It's so political. It's about banning guns, banning this, you know, banning everybody instead of targeted solutions like you're talking about, targeted solutions to a uh, the school shooting issue and who is usually responsible for the, those and how to red flag them and, or how to give family members at the state level using state laws rights. But now we're going to hear from President Biden tonight. What I'm concerned about is that we're not going to hear solutions like that. We're going to hear solutions that keep dividing the country apart, which doesn't do anything to help uh, uh, keep our kids safe. Yeah, and let's hope that that's not what happens. But traditionally, the response from him and others has been the following. Lie to people and tell them that there's a bunch of laws out there that could stop all this from happening, but we can't pass those laws because evil Republicans are blocking them. If they would only have voted for these bills, these things wouldn't be happening. And it's just not true. It's just absolutely inaccurate. It's not true. It's a blatant lie. It stands in the way of progress on this issue. And I hope that's not what he does again tonight. Because if he starts rolling out a bunch of a bunch of ideas that have nothing to do with these shootings, nothing. They may be what he supports on gun legislation, but they have nothing to do with these shootings. I think we're back to square one, unfortunately. And then people wonder why nothing ever happens. Well, that's why. Uh, because, but that, the, the, I hope that's not the case. Senator, we appreciate your work on this, and you've been working on this for a long time. And we fully support it. We think this is the right way to go. Thank you for being on the broadcast. Thank you for sharing this with our audience. It's important that people know what's happening here and that there are solutions. Thank you, Senator. Thank you both for having me on. And that's Senator Marco Rubio. The, the legislation is to it. Senate Bill uh, uh, 292, Senate Bill 391. There's, he's got uh, Democrats' support for this. And again, it's been out for years because they were dealing with Parkland. And, and you know, we see these again and again and again. And there's solutions here that ma- these are tailored to make sense for these One school students. One is a students. state, it's a state, it's, a, it's, yeah. it's, 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 Florida already is doing it, and it's been used 3,000 times, but it's a state incentive, right. incentive program. The other is just to make it, again, we know who is usually carrying these out. And it's, it doesn't have to impact everybody's rights, right? which is what the Democrat solution is usually, or what we think we'll hear from Joe Biden. These impact the people who should have their rights, impacted and they're short term so it's like even if you thought okay this is not right six month kind of program these are not and it takes people taking action but it gives people who say all the time yeah i knew this person was this we knew this person this something they can actually proactively do that can protect that person and other uh you know helpless children and i think we all have to you know understand that i think everybody this listens broadcast either a grandparent or a parent uh right now and they understand why it's it's of concern We'll be right back with Mike Pompeo. In my time in service, both as a CI director and as Secretary of State, I watched the good work that the ACLJ was doing here in the States and all across the world. The ACLJ's work at the UN overseas with the European Court of Justice is incredibly important. We have on our team lawyers, non-lawyers as well, that are policy experts. They're all engaged in foreign policy issues. We have been focused on protecting the nation state of Israel, particularly before the United Nations. We don't shy away from the battles that are going on at the UN and just complain about them. We actually try to go in and do something positive and actually affect change. The risk of a incomplete or unsolid relationship within the United States of America and Israel is real. Israel is very important to the ACLJ and we will always fight for Israel's rights. We had a series of cases at the European Court of Human Rights primarily dealing with religious liberty. And as Secretary of State, I saw this too. Nations that had more religious freedom were on firmer footing. They had better democracies. America has always been the world leader in religious liberties in freedom of conscience and freedom of speech. We've taken the First Amendment and that has been our cornerstone. It's to defend the rights of people of faith and others that are having their rights abused. We not only hold our government accountable, but we hold other governments accountable. You have to keep the battle going when it's not cool anymore. 
when it's not the number one story on TV, you have to actually be committed to finding it out, or else you'll never win. The ACLJ is front and center on this, whether it is going after the deep state, whether it is litigation that we're engaged in. Your support of the ACLJ enables us to do all of this. Go to ACLJ.org today. That's ACLJ.org. Welcome back to Secchio. It's been a great show today, a packed show today, and we continues on. So we just had Senator Marco Rubio. Now we've got a, a former Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, Senior Counsel for Global Affairs at the ACLJ. And Secretary Pompeo, this was something very troubling to me because we saw the, uh, the UN High Commission for Human Rights, the High Commissioner for Human Rights, and we do a lot of work at the Human Rights Council. It's, it's not the greatest place to always be. Uh, the U.S. is, I know the Trump administration pulled out. Which made sense. Uh, which makes sense. But, but she was there. And she starts parroting uh, the CCP talking points about the treatment of the Uyghurs. It, she actually said that the the, communi- the Chinese Communist Party's policies in that region of China to combat quote are to combat quote violent acts of extremism and terrorism and called the co- concentration camps. I mean, the U.S. has identified this as genocide, as quote vocational and educational training centers. At this point, I mean, should the U.N. be saying, and I think more countries in the U.S. could be more vocal, too, should she resign? Jordan, this is infuriating and it is immoral. Yeah, I, I think she's lost all credibility. Even the, even the traditionally progressive human rights groups are now calling for her resignation. There's Michelle Bachelet. We had trouble with her, too. She didn't want to talk about what was taking place in Venezuela and Cuba either. Um, she has been soft. She's been of the left. I had no idea that she was such in the pocket of the Chinese Communist Party. She, Jordan, she went and took this trip. There hadn't been an inspector in there for years. She took this trip. She was guarded. She saw what they wanted to show them. And then she walked out and literally uses the Chinese Communist Party's talking points to talk about what is truly some of the worst human rights violations in this century. They are taking a million people, Muslim people, uh, putting them in, in what look for all the world to be concentration camps, separating from their families, conducting forced sterilizations. And she walks out and says, it's all good. Uh, you, you can't have this. I hope Secretary General Guterres will fire her if she doesn't resign herself. This is a stain on Secretary Guterres as well. Uh, he, uh, he he needs to understand that what the Chinese Communist Party is doing in Western China, it will be a stain on his time if they refuse to call it what it is, which is genocide against these people. Mike, the high commissioner also praised the Chinese government's, and I'm quoting here, achievements in poverty alleviation and health care in other parts of their country. Now, what reality are they in here? Because this is absurd. Jay, it's, it's absolutely absurd. But there's long been a strain in American uh, politics as well. This as well, we're we brought five or six hundred million Chinese people out of poverty. F- fair enough. That, that's likely true. The freedoms that were destroyed, the, the way in which this was achieved, frankly, on the backs of American workers as well, is not something we should laud, uh, but rather it, it's something that we have to be deeply concerned about. To, for, for her to walk out and laud the Chinese Communist Party with what they're doing with these lockdowns, the way they treated our athletes when they came to the Olympics, the surveillance state that's being conducted against these people, the denial of basic property rights and human rights, there's zero religious freedom. Jay, Jay Jordan, you, you all know, this list is really long. Yeah. And to have the, the this senior person, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Michelle Bachelet, come out and say the Chinese Communist Party is essentially a model for what society should look like. Uh, it, frankly, it tells you how far the UN has fallen and how much damage the U.N. is now doing to its own credibility as an institution that actually delivers for people around the world. We always knew it was problematic. Yep. This is about as bad as I've seen. We have, I was, we still have a client, um, and, and you were it, was, it came right as, at the end of your administration, and you were helping us on this. We still have a client in prison in China for uh, Christian work. And, we you know, there were negotiations going on when you all were in power, and then, of course, that is totally stopped now. But this, Jordan, this is a real situation. And then to have the UN High Commissioner for human for human rights of all people say this, please. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think you know we've got Secretary Blinken, uh, the current Secretary of State, framed the visit as we're concerned the condition Beijing authorities imposed on the visit did not enable a complete and independent assessment. Surprise, surprise. Anyways, there. But I, I, as you said, Secretary Pompeo. Even if they didn't say, you know, even if they did impose those kind of views, that's what the Human Rights Commissioner should have focused on is that 
honestly, I couldn't even see what I came here to see. I, they would not. They prevented me from going to the places that we've been concerned about. But instead, it's a, it's it's she's on their talking points. I mean, and, and it, to me, I think what you said is very important. It goes to that bigger picture of the UN. Take it out of just the Human Rights Commission and go to the entire UN. And we've seen this with the World Health Organization. Are we seeing a repeat inside the UN that just everybody is afraid of upsetting China? Uh, they have no problem condemning us. They have no problem condemning our allies. It's precisely, you nailed it, Jordan. It's precisely the same phenomenon. They don't want to criticize the Chinese Communist Party. They are underwriting it. They know if they do, they'll get even less cooperation from China. And they, frankly, have become dependent on them, whether it's the World Health Organization or, in this case, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. I mean, let's, your listeners should know, there is extensive satellite imagery of what's taking place there. The reason both I originally and Secretary Blinken confirmed there was genocide wasn't because um, we didn't like China. It was because the treatment of these people is horrific. It is genocidal. No one disputes the data. And for her to go there and walk away and, and basically make the argument that my Chinese counterpart would make with me, Wang Zixie, would say, uh, Mr. Secretary, uh, this is about uh, stopping terrorism. These were terrorists. These are Muslim terrorists. That is just a flat out lie. She mouthed those words. And that is unacceptable for anybody who cares about human rights. She, she's she got to go. I hope Secretary General Guterres will let her go. And that she will finally put someone in place that will demand that the Chinese Communist Party treat its people with the dignity they deserve because they were made in the image of God. Final question today is on Ukraine. The president published an essay in the New York Times saying what he will do and what he won't do in Ukraine. Telegraphing the strategy from the president to the Russians to me, would hurt the United States, not help us. You know, I, I kind of like some of the stuff he said he would do. Uh, so sign me up for that. It's four months too late, maybe eight months too late. But some of it's good. That will be helpful so yeah. the Ukrainians can defend it. But to, but to spend so much time dwelling, sending, sending a clear message, right? We think about drawing red lines saying these are things you won't do. He drew a red line around ourselves. Right. These are things we won't do. That 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 is that violates. You know, when I was a kid at West Point, oh, goodness, too long ago, forty years ago now, th this was military strategy one hundred and one. Do not tell the enemy what you won't do. Uh, exactly. And certainly in public, and they've done that. It puts America at risk. It destroys the capacity to deter Vladimir Putin. And I'm afraid this will get more Ukrainian innocents killed, and yeah. we'll drag this out for 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 longer than it needed to go on. All right, folks, as always, it's great to have a secretary, uh, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo as part of our ACLJ team. On with a second, thank you, Secretary Pompeo. And, folks, uh, just to underscore again, uh, he's on the, the ACLJ team now and has been on the ACLJ team because it's because of your support for the ACLJ uh, that we're able to bring this team together. So when these issues come up, and I, that's why I love when we talk to Secretary Pompeo. It's not, we're not just talking about the news or reports or even the work of the ACLJ. He's able to say, yeah, I was talking to the, the official. This is what right. he would try to do to me. You could see how they they were engaged with the, the same officials. Not, yep. and, and on this issue alone, how absurd is it that it is only us, when I say us, on the right, willing to call out China for genocide against Muslims? Well, they tried to justify it as, well, see, we're just going after against, you know, Islamic terror. Yeah. And we know that that wasn't the case there. This right. is a very different Muslim population culturally right. and right. ideologically. And and so they tried to use that to get the world to, to give a pass, which usually the left would not give you a pass on. But they are right to China. And the global left, it's not even just the left of the U.S., it's the global left of the U.N. It's absurd. There should be worldwide unity when it comes to genocide and, and condemnation. And the administration continued that designation. I know. It's important to point that the Biden administration continued the designation put in place by Secretary Pompeo and the Trump administration. But they could demand that this commissioner is gone. She did not have to talk their talking voice. She should have said they wouldn't even let me go where I needed to go. Yeah. And that would have been a clear, clear cut. Go to ACLJ.org, stay updated with our work, and support us.